you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Hey, welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back into our Father's Word. Remember, we left off in Jeremiah 34, and we're going to pick up with verse 21. But I really want you to be alert. We're going to move into this 35th chapter, and I've warned you about this chapter. Some of you are going to think it's difficult. It isn't. And what of it you don't get, kind of put it on the shelf and don't worry about it for a while. It's a chapter that is kind of inserted to identify who the Kenite is. And I'm going to take you back into the Hebrew and teach you the translation rather than the transliteration of the name, the word Kenite, so that you truly understand. Because it is a very important thing, and for that reason, God inserted it here during the captivity of the king of Babylon, which is only a type of what's going to happen to you in this final generation, that is to say the generation of the fig, the fig tree, or spoken of by Christ, when the king of Babylon of that book of Revelation comes. It's a way to let you know exactly how things will come to pass. So with the, our father himself, in as much as there had been a little chicanery or trickery by Zedekiah in telling people to free their slaves, and then when Nebuchadnezzar withdrew, they took them all back into bondage. They backed up on their word, and God said, because of that, I have a sentence for, sentence for you. As you swore by passing through the sacrifice, you're going to be sacrificed. And we're going to pick it up and complete this 34th chapter. We ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Let's roll with it as God continues his uh, lecture to Jeremiah through, I'm sorry, Zedekiah through Jeremiah, chapter 34, verse 21, and it reads, And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his princes will I give into the hand of their enemies, that's God speaking, and into the hand of them that seek their life, and into the hand of the king of Babylon's army, which are gone up from you. In other words, they withdrew. But don't worry, they're coming back. Verse 22, Behold, I will command, saith the Lord, and cause them to return to this city. That's Jerusalem. And they shall fight against it, and take it, and burn it with fire. And I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without an inhabitant. What is an inhabitant? An inhabitant without Christ is not really living. They're spiritually dead. And in the futurist sense, you must look at it in that respect, that after the false Messiah sits in Jerusalem claiming to be Jesus, that all those, this is the great apostasy when the people, they don't know any better, they worship him as Christ when he's the false Christ. Then there is no really living there, for they have apostatized themselves into the deception of Satan himself. Now, to be very appropriate, God has inserted, as I forementioned, this 35th chapter to identify those that you're supposed to be on guard against, not to bother them, not to hate them even necessarily, hate what they do, but to be very aware whereby you can identify, in a sense, it is the negative side or the flip side of the key of David, and it's very valuable information. So, with uh, that having been said, let's see how sharp you are. Hang on, don't make it difficult, but be alert. Chapter 35, verse 1, and it reads, The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, verse 2, Go unto the house of the Rechabites, and speak unto them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Now, why would God tell Jeremiah to do this? Well, it's very important. It's important, first of all, that you know who the Rechabites are, because these are Kenites. So, with that thought in mind, I want you to turn back to First Chronicles. I want you to go to chapter 2. And in the 55th verse, we're going to identify who these Rechabites are and why, within the chapter, we're going to find out why God would tell Jeremiah. Incidentally, these are the offspring of Cain. 
and I'll document that in just a moment, beyond any shadow of a doubt. Why would God say bring them into his house? We'll find out. Okay, First Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, and it reads, And the families of the scribes, now this is tagged on to the lineage of Judah. These are not children of Judah. I want to make that very clear, but they are the scribes for the tribe of Judah. These of the scribes which dwelt at Jabez, the Tyrathites, the Shemathites, the Shushathites, these are the Kenites, K-E-N-I-T-E-S, important, beloved. These are the Kenites that came of Hemath, the father of the house of Rechab. And naturally, Rechabites are Kenites. Now, not too many uh, seeing a translation rather than a transliteration. I want to give you a little Hebrew lesson, if I may. I want to pull up on the screen, if I may, the word Kenites as it is pronounced in the Hebrew tongue before the translation. And it is Keni. And what does it mean? Um, it is um, as used in 1 Chronicles 2.55, which we just came from, Keni. It's a patron or uh, from 7014, we'll find out who that is in a moment, a Kenite or a member of the tribe of Cajun. Now, well, who is this Cajun? That's Cain. Let's go to 7014, as you notice that that is the prime, and it is Cain, the same as 7013 with a play upon the affinity to 7069, Cajun, the name of the first child. Who was the first child? It was Cain, of course also of a place in Palestine, and of an Oriental tribe. Now, you've heard me say many times that you can understand where Cain went to take his wife, and I always fix it in the, the near Middle East, that even into Mongolia, as a matter of fact, you can trace the genealogy there, even in modern history, and when you know what you're talking about. In other words, when you know Cain and the Kenites, who they really are. They lived through the flood quite uh, um, in good shape because uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55 was considerably after the flood. They're still alive and doing well. So there you have it. The ch offspring of the first child, meaning Cain, and the father said, hey, go get some of them and bring them into my house, that would be the temple itself, and give them some wine. Now let's go back and try to put all this together. This is not difficult. Don't make it complicated. Follow along with me. But this is why you must be sharp when you study God's Word. Okay? Verse 3, as we continue. Then I took Jeazaniah, that's to say whom Yah hears in the Hebrew tongue, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Hebazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. Now, whoa, wait a minute. How did Jeremiah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Habazaniah, you see, many people would say, well, yes, that's Jeremiah, the author of this book, uh, at the hand of God. Now, that's not true. It's not true at all. This is God's way of telling you when you're studying genealogy, you must be very careful. Do you remember who the Jeremiah of the book is? I want you to turn back with me, if you will, to chapter 1 of Jeremiah, verse 1, and let's, let's get this straight. Uh, Jeremiah's father was not Habazaniah, but was what? Chapter 1, verse 1 of the great book of Jeremiah, and the Jeremiah, which means to the one God launches forth in the Hebrew tongue, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah. So you see, we're talking about two different Jeremiahs of the priest that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Do you remember why that Jeremiah had the right, the kinsman redeemer right, to buy the piece of priest ground in Anathoth, which Anathoth in the Hebrew tongue meaning the answer to prayer? <clears throat> because that's where he was from. That's where his kinsmen lived. Therefore, he had the right. You see, many might say, well, 
then you're talking Kenites. Well, actually, Moses' father-in-law was a Kenite. Jethro was a Kenite. You got to be sharp. It's not complicated. But how, you know, to a wise person, how could Jethro have been a Median priest and have been a Kenite at the same time? It's not possible. Two totally separate religions because Medan was the son of Abraham by his second wife, Keturah. Therefore, there is no way he could have been a Kenite. Why would the Kenites drive uh, Jethro's girls away from the well to water their sheep? Because they were strangers there. In other words, Jethro is called a Kenite because he lives in the country of the Kenite, such as um, I'm an Arkansan because I live in Arkansas, but I'm an Irishman because my ancestors came from Ireland. And uh, I'm an American because I live in the United States of America. But when someone is called a certain thing, you must comprehend from tracing that genealogy which term is being utilized to describe the subject and the object being discussed, or you're not going to know or understand clearly what's being said. So, with that having been said, just to learn, this is to teach you to stay on guard, then we see that God himself again calls the Rechabites into this house, that's to say the Kenites, so as to give them wine, and away we go, okay? But at the same time, teaching you, be careful. In other words, when you study the genealogy of the Kenites, uh, we'll, talk, we'll say more about that in a moment. Verse 4, let's cover it first. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdala, that's to say whom Yah makes great, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Messiah, that's to say the work of Yah, the son of Shoam, retribution, the keeper of the door. In other words, I brought them right in there. Now, verse 5. And I set before the sons of the house of the Rechabites, these Kenites, pots full of wine and cups, and I said unto them, Drink ye wine. You see, God knew beforehand what would happen. Observe, verse 6. But they said, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, that's to say whom Yah impels, the, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. I mean, they are obedient to their father. This is why God had them brought into his temple. Even though they are negative or the negative part of God's plan, that God would put a, a seal even on Cain saying, don't anybody kill him. There was a purpose for them. And we see God bringing them in. Let's go on with verse 7. Neither shall you build, this is what uh, their father had told them, neither shall you build house, nor sow seed, nor plant vineyards, nor have any. But all your days you shall dwell in tents, in other words, you're going to be vagabonds, that you may live many days in the land where you be strangers. In other words, um, without taking root, uh, no one's going to kill you because you will not stay in one place long enough to have been found out necessarily or their own ways uh, make, would have made them very unpopular. Does that ring a bell in your mind from Scripture? It should. What was the curse God placed on Cain? This is why God wanted them brought into his temple uh, to, to create this fact for the eyes of all those that can see to see, documenting that it was a reality that they had come through the flood and were very active. Let's go back to the chapter and verse that God would have placed this curse upon Cain, chapter 4. 
in the book of Genesis and verse 12. What does it say? Genesis chapter 4, verse 12, and it reads, God's curse upon Cain, when thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And I promise you, if you, um, and understand, this has nothing to do with our brother Judah. This is the Kenite, the sons of Cain, that you will not find a farmer even to this day that is of that tribe. Why? God's promise is faithful and forever. They may own land, but they will hire other people to farm or to do that farm work because they cannot work the soil even to this day. God brings this point out in this 35th chapter as an absolute, whereby you have positive proof. And also, he's going to make a covenant with them before he allows them to leave this place. And it's important that you know that covenant, for it is important to you to be able to, to understand that that is written as an example in Revelation chapter 2, 9, Revelation chapter 3, 9, the two churches that God had no fault with through his son. As a matter of fact, the church of Smyrna and Philadelphia, both those churches knew who those were that were Kenites of the synagogue of Satan, but claimed to be of our brother Judah. That, that is absolutely necessary for you to understand the key of David or to have Christ happy with you in your church, so to speak, whether it's your home study or whatever. If you do not understand those things as it is written in Revelation 2.9, where Christ would be speaking to the churches, and 3.9, the church of Philadelphia, then you haven't got it all together. Therefore, it's so important that you have this prime. Now, many would say, well, what is this really all about? Well, let's follow along a little bit. Had we continued reading in the fourth chapter of Genesis, you would have found that Cain's genealogy is singled out and kept all by itself. Adam's genealogy then begins in next to the last verse on into chapter 5 of that great book of Genesis. And do you know who is missing from Adam's genealogy? Cain. Well, why is Cain missing? Because he wasn't his son. That's what, therefore, he's not in his genealogy. So, that's very important because it gives you that key to David of Revelation 3, 9 that is paramount to understand prophecies as they come to pass. Okay, now let's return, if we may, to this 35th chapter of Jeremiah. And we'll pick it up with the 8th verse, and let's cover a little ground and understand why God has, is doing this. It's for your benefit, all right? Verse 8. Thus have we observed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that's the father of the Kenites, our father, in all that he hath charged us to drink no wine all our days, we, our wives, our sons, nor our daughters. Verse 9, nor to build houses for us to dwell in. Neither have we vineyard, nor field, nor seed. You know why I feel that they would never drink wine? That would become, come to symbolize Christ's blood, and they will never have anything to do with Christ, all right? Because they are of the opposite uh, tribe. That is to say, those that God placed a mark on and said, leave them alone, don't kill them. Remember when Cain would come to him and say, everybody that finds Bill will have kill me. And just keep moving around, son. All right? Verse 10. But we have dwelt in tents and have obeyed and done according to all that Jonadab our father commanded us. God respects obedience. You want your prayers answered? Be obedient to God. I guarantee you, your prayers will be answered for that that is best for you. Verse 11, but it came to pass when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up into the land that we said, come and let us go to Jerusalem. You got it? 
let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans, that's to say the Babylonians, and for fear of the army of the Syrians, that's the tribes that took captive the other ten tribes of Israel, so we dwell at Jerusalem. Now this is where the key comes in. Uh, to dwell, what, what do you call someone in the Greek that dwells at Jerusalem? It's Eudas, or a Jew, because they live in the land of Judea. But it does not necessarily, the, the other meaning of Eudas is a, a child or offspring of Judah. So you see, you have the old geographic thing again. If you live there, you're called a Jew. The Kenites moved into Jerusalem, and they, people began to call them Jews, or citizens of Jerusalem. And naturally, when they, being vagabonds, when they moved on, they would maintain in part some of them this name, and this has been a terrible thorn in the side of our true brother Judah. And it would be for this reason that Jesus would say, in Revelation, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read it for you, if I may. Revelation chapter 2, 9, I've quoted it enough, concerning the church of Smyrna, the only, one of the only churches that Christ found no fault with. I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews, or of, are of Judah, and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. It's important, beloved, that you know that. Now, are you supposed to make war against them? No. What did Christ tell you to do with the tares? Leave them alone. But do have the knowledge. That's extremely important. Now, what, how does God reward this? Why would he ask these people into the very temple of God? Let's find out. Verse 12. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah, saying, 13, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, go and tell the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, will ye not receive instruction to hearken to my word, saith the Lord. Uh, God's a little jealous here, you understand? These people obey every word their father says, right, I mean, to the letter. But God sends Jeremiah to talk to Zedekiah and the rest of them all down through the years, and they turn their back on him. So he's saying again, verse 14, the words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, that he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are performed. They do it. For unto this day they drink none, but obey their father's commandments. Notwithstanding, notwithstanding, I... That's emphatic in the Hebrew. I have spoken unto you, rising early and speaking, but you hearken not unto me. You won't listen to a thing I say. It's what God says to his children. And absolutely, today, throughout this nation, most people are biblically illiterate, are, are, are so unfamiliar with the word of God that, uh, that a, a person schooled in the word can't even carry a decent conversation on with them. It's, it's a sad truth, but it is the truth. God created man in his image, he and the angels. He's your father. And to treat your father like that, like he didn't exist, is, 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 one, is um, an abomination. But Satan's own children obey him to the letter. But God's children are stubborn, stiff-necked, think they know everything and they know nothing. Not even where they came from. They're lucky if they know two generations back where they came from and their heritage, much less back to the throne. Verse 15, I have sent also unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them, saying, Return ye now every man from his evil way, and amend your doings, and go not after other gods to serve them. And ye shall dwell in the land which I have given to you, and to your fathers, 
but ye have not inclined your ear nor hearkened unto me. God saying, my children just won't listen to me. So what's he going to do? Verse 16, because the sons of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, have performed the commandment of their father, which he commanded them, but this people hath not hearkened unto me. Now, why did God send for them? Is it beginning to stack up for you? He wanted to show his own children that Satan's children obey him to the letter. And God's just a little jealous. He's hurt by it. He has emotions, and he has feelings. And, and I would say that 90% of his children don't even wish him a good day. And, and rarely, if ever, tell him, Father, I love you. And they think that prayer is some ritualistic uh, thing as pagans must go through to even talk to him when he's wiser than anything you've ever run across, and you just talk to him. Father, I love you. He's our nearest kin. And we treat him as a whole like he didn't exist. And then many will say, I wonder why he doesn't answer my prayers. And the only time they ever even think of him is if, if they are dying. Or if they're in such dire straits, they don't know which way to turn. It's terrible. It's a disgrace that we have such a loving father that he goes to such pains as this and brings a message forth with simplicity that a child can understand. Many of you may think this is deep, this we're covering. I have, I have eight-year-olds that study with me via television that, are, that understand this totally and completely because of the simplicity that is involved within it. Comes down, God's not happy. He said, Satan's children obey everything he says, but what do I get? Verse 17, therefore, God's going to put a little sentence on us here. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, his full title. Behold, I will bring upon Judah and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the evil that I have pronounced against them because I have spoken unto them, but they have not heard. But they have not answered. In other words, God saying, but they have not heard, and I have called unto them, but they have not answered. How many times has God called? How many times has he touched you? How many times has he visited you and you weren't even aware of it? You know, there is a disgraceful thing that takes place. Anyone that loves our Father's creation, if you go out in the late afternoon or evening, early evening, and you hear the crickets in the animal kingdom, you hear cows bawl or moo, and the little old crickets and the frogs are just singing up a storm, and you can start praying and the presence of the Holy Spirit will move in and a silence comes over the land. Not one of those insects let out a chirp. It gets deathly still. You see, they know. They feel the presence of our Father. But man just lollygags along on his way as if it's the same old world every day. Wake up in a different place and mood every day or a different thought in mind shifting like drifting sand with no stability whatsoever when they're the children of the living God. It's a disgrace. It hurts his feelings. He has every right to allow his children, if they want to be ignorant, to be ignorant. If they want to be biblically illiterate, be biblically illiterate. You see, the contest is this. You're going to make your mind up whether you're going to love our Father or your, Satan is the prince of the air of this earth age or whether you're going to keep staying in this earth just floating around like a, a, a biscuit at sea. A white cap on a wave that has this shape one time and something else the next. 
never amounting to a hill of beans because you don't seek from where all wisdom flows, that is to say, from our Father. Everything in this world has a purpose because it aligns with God's plan, He that created all things. So, you have a choice. You can either be a part, or hey, adios, out of here, gone. You won't be around. The only life there truly is, is eternal life. Or you can be like the pigs. You can live your flesh life. Well, I think even all of God's animals, He loves them, they'll be there. You may not be, though. So I sure don't want to insult pigs for those that are just simply illiterate and want to stay that way. You know, education has nothing to do with intelligence directly. Indirectly, yeah. Any intelligent person can learn from nature itself. The analogy I just used of the crickets and the frogs and so forth, hey, they know you can learn from them if you can't learn any other way. When the spirit comes near, the Ruhaka, Hebrew for spirit, the Holy Spirit, to, to know that God has touched you, that he loves you. God created man for his pleasure. You can document that in the last verse of the last chapter four in the book of Revelation. That is to say chapter four in the book of Revelation. You can document it there. And your father loves you. The thing is, have you given him any pleasure lately? Then don't ask him for any blessings if you haven't. Okay, if, how, well, how do I give him pleasure? Just tell him you love him. It doesn't take much to please him. Just be obedient as best you can. Yeah, you're going to fall short. But he even built in an emergency clause for that. Because of Christ's blood on the cross, all you do is repent and paid in full. You've got a fresh start. He loves you. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go with the next verse here, which was verse 18. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, this is to the Kenites, understand this. I hope it makes you a little jealous. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, because ye have obeyed the commandments of Jonadab your father and kept all his precepts and done according unto all that he hath commanded you, Verse 19, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, shall not want a man to stand before me forever. That means, what does that mean? It's a Hebrew metaphor or idiom, if you prefer, that means the Kenites will always have a leader that will hold them together and give them the direction. Naturally, it's the negative part of God's plan, which ultimately is positive. There is no negative side to God's plan, ultimately. But God blessed them. Any way you want to slice it, he blessed them because of their obedience. He blessed them to the point that they can be far more successful than you if you stay biblically illiterate. If it, were a, if it were a task that required an IQ of 140 or 160, or I'll even say if it required an IQ of 120 to understand God's Word. You see, in the simplicity in which God brought forth His Word, an IQ of far less than that can see and understand the Word of God. He didn't make it hard for us. If you have any common sense, he made it easy. Let me ask you a question. If our own father would bless the Kenite with that one thing, that they would always have a teacher and a leader do you think he would not do much more than that for his own children that love him and are obedient? Of course he will. Already has. His blessings just pour forth abundantly to those that reach out and say, Father, I love you. 
not make a big show about serving him. He's more natural than we are. He's supernatural. He doesn't want the big show. He just wants you to be honest with him. Let him know that you love him. And that makes you somebody. It makes you a child, nearest of kin, to the living God, our Father, the Creator. That's really something. It's yours, but you have to claim it. I hope you enjoyed that chapter. Don't ever forget it. Don't ever forget that chapter. It's extremely important as a key to understanding our Father and His Word. Gives you a little glimpse of His own emotions. His little jealous, but yet would bless this one because He respects obedience. If He respects their obedience to that point, Boy, will he love you for your obedience to him. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?